Far too many see the Union war effort in the American Civil War as a monolith. Patriotic men across the north from Maine to Minnesota flocking in mass to gather under national colors to fight to preserve the Union and to rid the nation of the hateful institution of slavery. As will be evidenced in this episode, nothing could be farther from the truth. Within the Federal Union in the summer of 1863, there was war weariness. Men of influence, like New York politician Samuel J. Tilden, and artist inventor Samuel F. B. Morse, dared to call for peace at any price. And it wasn't only men of power. There were some, men and women representing several societal classes, who profess pro-Southern sentiments. Indeed, New York City had its share of these so-called copperheads. In February of 1863, a development added to their disaffection, the passage of the Enrollment and Conscription Act, a draft. So by the 4th of July that year, with word that R.E. Lee was at the head of a Confederate army in Pennsylvania, and U.S. Grant siege dragging on and on down at Vicksburg, Mississippi, not everyone felt like celebrating independence. Too many saw no end to the conflict, and now men were going to be forced to fight in it. Taken all together, a cauldron of simmering, seething fuel. All that was needed was a spark, and it came on a Monday the 13th of July. What followed? Still, the largest civil and most racially charged urban disturbance in American history. And now, it's story. The last five letters of history spell story, and that's exactly how history should be taught. Numbers and dates have no soul. Such presentations fall flat, for history is alive and relevant. Welcome to Threads from the National Tapestry, stories from the American Civil War. This series will feature events and people from that period and will strive to make you feel as if you were there to show that history is indeed a story. The war was in its third summer, and down at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, ship joiners were on strike. They got $2.50 a day. They wanted three. Looking for political gain, the governor of the Empire State, Horatio Seymour, was in town. He was there to address the New York Democratic Union Association. Back in 1860 and 61, to try to defuse secession, he advocated compromise. In March of 63, he campaigned for reconciliation and an end to the war. It was a close election, but he was reelected. Aware that New York City was a hotbed of anti-war sentiment, he lashed out at the Conscription Act. He thought it unconstitutional. Concluding his speech, he thundered, Remember this, that the bloody, treasonable, and revolutionary doctrine of public necessity can be proclaimed by a mob as well as a government. Other speakers echoed Seymour's sentiment. Some even defended secession and states' rights. This wasn't new. Back in January of 1861, the then Mayor Fernando Wood, in a letter to the city's Common Council, believed that New York City should withdraw from the Union and become a free city. The night of Seymour's speech, the 4th, there were 17 displays of fireworks around the city. The biggest was in Central Park. Some 300,000 watched the recreation of the duel between the ironclads, the USS Monitor and the CSS Virginia. In 1863, New York City was a blend of the best and worst. Back in 1825, the opening of the Erie Canal made the city a commercial monster. In 1860, the nation's largest urban area teemed with somewhere around 800,000 people. Traffic jams were common. To escape them, the heat and the masses, 
the wealthy moved northward. In the era of the brownstone, the war seemed far away. So distant, those who had money had no qualms about spending it. Old families vied for power with those who, as one put it, were the new vulgar wealth from California. Lorenzo Del Monaco's restaurant on Fifth Avenue was the best in town, and there were well over 6,000 gambling establishments. And speaking of gaming, speculators had agents on every battlefield. After each union setback, they sent telegrams which alerted those playing the stock market. Defeat meant currency was about to be debased and gold prices would rise. This new draft worried many. It seemed yet another blow to individual and to states' rights. And the real kicker for many was that any man who could put up $300 to pay a substitute was excused. Washington City said the draft would increase the number of volunteers. Those that didn't have $300 saw the draft as class discrimination and reinforced the off-repeated quip that this was a rich man's war but a poor man's fight. Broadway was the economic equator. West of it was the dollar side. East, the shilling side. The heart of the bad section was the Sixth Ward, and in the very bowels of the Sixth Ward was Five Forks. Rumor had it that a murder occurred there every night. Today, a part of Columbus Park, but back then, home to the very poorest, and that included many Irish immigrants. Sprinkled about, a few free blacks lived there. Charles Dickens wrote, All that is loathsome, drooping, and decayed is here. Names of tenement houses there reflected just that. Gates of Hell, Jacob's Ladder, Brickbat Mansion. Living down in the dark and dank basements, the poorest of the poor. Just north was the Bowery. Once it was nice, now it wallowed in destitution. Along the East River, the Fourth Ward was also in sad shape. Kit Burns' place, Sportsman's Hall, was typical of these rough neighborhoods. Inside, there were dog and rat fights. For ten cents, Kit's son-in-law, Jack the Rat, would bite off the head of a mouse. For twenty-five cents, a rat. Gallus Mag was the female bouncer at One-Armed Charlie's. With an ear firmly between her teeth, she escorted rowdies out into the street. Story was she had a jar behind the bar with all the ears she had bitten off. And then there was a 350-pound black female behemoth who looked like a huge black turtle standing on its hind legs. And she was called just that, Sue the Turtle. The entire city was full of such characters, and violence was always just beneath the surface. It only needed a scratch. Indeed, New York City's history walked hand in hand with violence. In 1712, armed force had to put down a slave revolt. In 1741, another insurrection, one far more serious than before, was squelched. Then there was the Doctors' Riot of 1788, the Unemployment Riot in 1807-08, the Bread Riot in 1837. In the 1820s, to protect turf, as Martin Scorsese's The Gangs of New York portrayed, quasi-military groups sprang up. Aware of their clout, politicians wooed them and vice versa. There were the shirt tails, the plug uglies, the roach guards. A rabbit was a tough guy, and a dead rabbit meant one of the toughest of the tough. A gang even adopted that name. Their violent equal, the Bowery Boys, who dressed and looked almost aristocratic. When the dead rabbits and Bowery Boys battled, It was an announced event, and not to be outdone, 
Local volunteer firemen banded and could be just as violent as the gangs. Arrests were made, but charges seldom stuck. And punishment? Almost never. As to issues that caused the war, the city, thanks to the pre-war Southern business, was strongly pro-slave. All abolitionist rhetoric did was to make it racial, and nativism made it worse. As to law enforcement, in the spring of 1857, the Republican-dominated New York State Legislature abolished the city's municipal police and replaced them with a metropolitan police district. Regardless of the legislation, the two police forces operated at the same time, and that made the summer of 57 one of near riot, until finally Mayor Wood disbanded the municipal police. That left the New York Metropolitan Police Force, who at first were decked out like bobbies. The Irish took great exception to that. Policemen wore star-shaped copper badges, hence our use of the terms copper and cop. Many in uniform were on the take. When the war began, New York City's deep-seated troubles simmered thanks to early war enthusiasm. But by September of 1862, open dissent was alive and well. But ten months later, in the week following July the 4th, with news of Union victories at Gettysburg and Vicksburg. The editor of the New York Tribune, Horace Greeley, took editorial pen in hand and blasted pro-secessionist. He reprinted a document from a secessionist organization within the city. In it, item number seven proclaimed that, should the Confederate Army capture Washington and exterminate the band of thieves, we should regard it as divine intervention. For months, the New York City anti-war factions just needed a spark, and as we noted, the draft provided it. Drawings for it were to begin one week after the 4th. The War Department made clear, no local assistance, rather, Federal enrollment officers and clerks would denote who were and were not eligible for conscription. Greeley's Tribune could not gracefully oppose the draft, so it merely reported it without opinion. But other papers weighed in. The Daily News believe the draft's evident aim is to lessen the number of Democrats at the next election. The Journal of Commerce blasted Lincoln and abolitionists, calling both nothing more or less than murderers. The world likened the act to British Navy press gangs. Thus far, the masses had reacted with caution. Meekly, it accepted the business of canvassing working-class neighborhoods. But beneath the proceedings, there was dark rumbling. The first drawing of names began Saturday, July 11th. The location was 677 Third Avenue, near 46th Street, 9th District. Doors opened promptly at 9 a.m. Over 100 men and women pushed their way in to watch and to listen. Two or three soldiers from the Invalid Corps monitored the proceedings. It was a bleak room. It featured crossed U.S. flags affixed to gas fixtures. In front, a long table with eight to ten seated enrollment clerks. No railing separated anything or anybody. As proceedings began, there was no speech. There was no prayer. Plain and simple. This was business. Captain Charles E. Jenkins U.S. Provost Marshal for the 9th Congressional District, read his orders from the president. Then the drawing for draftees began. All names inside the tumbler lived in Ward 22. At 9.45 a.m., the wheel was turned. The lid was unlocked. And with jacket removed and right shirt sleeve rolled up, a blindfolded 
Clerk Charles H. Carpenter reached in. As he did, the room went deathly silent. William Jones, 46th Street near 10th Avenue, was the first name. Each drawn name was shouted, and it was shouted out into 3rd Avenue. After each announcement, there were snickers, jeers, guffaws, swearing, and abusive comments about abolitionists, Lincoln, and the rich. Occasionally, a girlfriend or a wife shrieked or swooned, but there was no real disorder. The crowd did take sadistic pleasure when six draft enrollment clerks heard their own names called. By six that evening, 1,236 had been drawn. To fill the district's quota, 264 more names would be called on Monday. Already, rumors reached Police Superintendent John A. Kennedy. He heard that a pro-South organization, the Knights of the Golden Circle, were going to seize the arsenal at the corner of 7th and 35th Streets that evening. He sent 16 policemen there, but Nothing happened. New York City had 32 local police precincts, and all were connected by five main telegraph lines, which ran to the basement of police headquarters at 300 Mulberry Street. On Sunday, the 12th of July, it was unpleasantly hot, and so was talk about the draft. The names drawn the day before were the talk of the town. The next day, Sunday, New York Governor Seymour was in town to inspect harbor defenses, and City Mayor George Updike attended the theater. The weather remained steamy that night, and mixed with strong drink and brewing issues, hatred stirred. There was a report that a John Andrews was making an anti-draft, anti-black speech to a crowd in the 10th Ward, somewhere along Allen Street. Incited, some chased down blacks in five points and were beaten. Police Superintendent Kennedy was aware of the disturbances, but reasoned that the next day, Monday, was a working day and all would return to normal. By 9 a.m. on an overcast Monday the 13th, there were indications that despite the beginning of the work week, normalcy would take a holiday. Indeed, since 6 a.m., two mobs had been gathering. Men and women in both were armed. Finally, the two mobs began to move. They drifted northward up 8th and 9th Avenues. Smaller groups split off into side streets. Stopping at shops, they encouraged others to join them. It was noisy, but so far, orderly. Around 7 a.m., Superintendent Kennedy got word that an entire street crew from the 19th Ward had failed to show, and that got him thinking something was wrong. Meanwhile, the two moving columns merged in a vacant lot just east of Central Park. Just after 8 a.m., while screaming defiance, the combined mob moved south down 5th and 6th Avenues. And their verbal targets, Provost Marshal Jenkins, Abraham Lincoln, and the federal government. Perched above, signs that read, no draft. Kennedy and some of his police moved far to the south around 8.30 a.m. Then they began to swing northward. About 60 headed to East 59th Street near 3rd Avenue and the enrollment office. 70 were sent to East 29th near 4th Avenue to guard the Broadway police office. While they did, two more angry columns merged at 47th Street and headed east as one. Its size estimated anywhere from five to 15,000, so great its number that it took 25 minutes to pass a single point. At 9 a.m., Kennedy knew he had a full-blown emergency. Already, communication between precincts had been compromised, for the mob had torn down telegraph lines as they turned onto 3rd Avenue. Their destination? The district, where names were being called. 
Sixty officers formed a human wall in front of the building as the surging crowd approached. One member of the police telegraph bureau got a wire through. It was from Mulberry Street. A mob was at 677 Third Avenue. And then, like so many human events over the course of time, we're not sure who or what. Some say there was a single pistol shot. Others, that the 264th drawn name had just been called. We do know this. The mob, with bricks and clubs, smashed the windows of the enrollment office. The black joke volunteer firemen had joined the mob, and as one, all charged the police. That 60-man force held for a short while, but overwhelmed, Provost Marshal Jenkins, a clerk, and the police force had to escape by way of 2nd Avenue. Inside the enrollment office, the revolving drum was smashed and the office set afire. The mob now moved east and west, and in doing so, collided with 50 soldiers from the Union Invalid Corps. Thrown bricks and cobblestones rained down on them. Lieutenant Abel Reed formed his men in a double line. His first line fired blanks over the heads of the mob. Still, they rushed forward. His second line fired live ammunition. The surge stopped. A half dozen went down. And then again, they charged. At least two soldiers did not escape. Though the crowd in front of the Broadway enrollment office had been dispersed, 3rd Avenue was now a throbbing beehive of violence. Police Superintendent Kennedy, unarmed and in a one-horse carriage, personally moved toward the eye of the human hurricane. The mob engulfed him. He, the son of an Irish immigrant, was slashed, knifed, and beaten from head to toe. As the mob moved on, two men rescued Kennedy. Placed in the back of a wagon and under a pile of old socks, they returned him to police headquarters. From there, he was taken to Bellevue Hospital, while five police squads drove the crowd back to 45th Street. But that was all temporary. There were just too many. In a matter of minutes, all 44 officers were down or injured. The mob, now estimated at 50,000, spilled on to 35th Street, looting, burning, and bent on destruction. The worst fire was at the 3rd Avenue Enrollment Office. Its upper floors were a tenement house filled with working-class families. Flames continued to climb and dance there. So much so, the whole block was gutted. With thousands screaming, down with the rich man. Many lingered near a construction site where a man standing on the roof of a shanty was shouting. It was John Andrews again. Word was he was from Virginia, and above the den he praised the action of the mob but warned, you must organize. Meanwhile, any reporter or citizen who in any way was believed an abolitionist or a figure of authority was set upon. Telegraph lines, rails, avenues to the outside world were torn down or ripped up. And the mob found willing recruits, far too many who wanted nothing more than a chance to plunder. I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone for listening to Threads from the National Tapestry. You know, each of these episodes is the result of hours and hours of research and preparation. And it means a great deal to me and our production team to see the likes, the comments, and views. I mean, let me make clear that everything we do here will always, always be accessible to any who are curious to learn about the American Civil War. But we would like to ask you to consider to become a member, uh, a Threads loyalist, if you will. For less than $5 each month, your support will help us to continue sharing our passion for that tumultuous yet important period of history. Joining is quite easy to do. At the top of each show description, you'll find uh, a link, if you will, to join whether you're watching, 
liking, commenting, or becoming a Threads loyalist, if you click on that link, your support for Threads from the National Tapestry will mean a great deal to me, to our team, and there's no question, any contribution, your support certainly makes a difference. And it's a wonderful acknowledgement for what we try to do. Thank you. By early afternoon, portions returned to the Broadway enrollment office that had closed at 11.15 a.m. It was smashed. The whole block between 24th and 25th Street was in flames. The incensed mass now moved toward another source of their seething anger, the New York City Orphan Asylum for Colored, situated between 43rd and 44th Streets on 5th Avenue. In their collective minds, the logic was clear. There would be no draft but for the war, and there would be no war but for slavery. Slaves were black and all blacks, therefore, were responsible. 237 children were now in harm's way, none over 12 years of age. The superintendent of the orphanage and 50 adults barricaded the front door while the children were marched out the back. With cries of burn the black nest, the mob broke in. One source tells us all 237 miraculously escaped. Another recounts that one little girl was left behind. Found hiding under a bed, she was killed. Inside, vandals stole everything. The parade of those carrying away stolen goods down Fifth Avenue stretched for ten blocks. Looted, the orphanage was burned to the ground. Three other buildings on the block shared the same fate. With Superintendent Kennedy down, the president of the police commission, Thomas C. Acton, now took charge in Manhattan. A strong unionist, he ordered all police reserves to rendezvous at 300 Mulberry Street. He asked Mayor Updike to call out federal and militia units. Meanwhile, an unruly assemblage formed in City Hall Park, but the greatest number lingered on 3rd Avenue down around 35th Street. By now, it was wanton plunder. The collective target became the New York State Armory on 2nd Avenue at 21st Street and the Union Steamworks where other arms were stored. With cries of, to the armory, where individuals could arm themselves, the mob swarmed. Some 10,000 streamed down 2nd Avenue. It was about 4 p.m. when they charged the main entrance of the armory. Two were cut down, but little could be done to hold back the irresistible human tide. All policemen that tried to do so were routed. Some 100 counterattacked and did succeed in scattering those not already inside the armory. While the third floor was searched for weapons and ammunition, a portion of the mob set fire to the first floor. Flames spread, rioters spill from everywhere, but many of those still on the upper floors were burned or trampled to death trying to get out. Weeks later, 50 barrels containing human bones were collected and carried out. The some 10,000 at the armory represented only a portion. The majority had fanned out east and west, reuniting many started down Broadway. Plain clothed detectives sent word to Mulberry Street that police headquarters was the next target. Wall Street and the New York Sub Treasury were also threatened. Police Commission President Acton had fewer than 150 men. He decided his men would attack, and to lead them, he handpicked Daniel Carpenter, who led 125 officers. With Acton's final instructions make no arrests. Off they went, left on Bleecker for two blocks, then a right wheel on Broadway. When they turned, they saw an ocean of angry people that stretched as far as the eye could see, armed with brickbats, clubs, pitchforks, iron bars, guns, and pistols. Behind them, smoke and burning buildings. In front, people fleeing from the mob. 
leading the unruly mass, a big man who carried a large American flag. And beside him, a man with a placard that read, No Draft. Carpenter ordered one company left to flank the throng, and another right to do the same. Carpenter then ordered the remaining men to charge. The mob stopped at the sight of the advancing police, then snarling, lurched forward. Like a swaying forest perched atop this mass of humanity, locust wood clubs now rose in unison. It was then the uniformed flankers struck the mob's flanks, and the combatants battled back and forth. It took about 15 minutes, but the mob fell back with the police in pursuit. Incredibly, no police officer had gone down. Discipline and training had been the difference. Mercifully, the cover of night finally carpeted disturbing scenes from the day. During the evening, small pockets of the mob emerged from dark places to remove their wounded. Some 20 buildings had been gutted or burned to ashes. Twenty more were ablaze. From 49th Street South, the island of Manhattan was a battleground. And yet, under the dark canopy of night, small groups still roamed. All through the first day of rioting, and now into the night, blacks had been targeted, hunted like animals. If found, they were beaten, burned, or lynched. One more event to note that day of rioting. While twilight's shadows lengthened into night, a little after 8 p.m., the big man with the oversized American flag led a swaggering crowd toward City Hall Park. They were organized and were headed for the offices of Horace Greeley's New York Tribune. Some chanted, We'll hang old Greeley to a sour apple tree. Outspoken and bewhiskered, he refused to flee and unbelievably left his office with two others to face the crowd. Incredibly, no one recognized him, and his party slipped through and made their way to dinner. Two police squads finally arrived and dispersed this last assault. It was now about 10 p.m. Rioting was done for the day. Around 11.30 p.m., there was a huge thunderstorm. It dampened some of the fires and drove what lawless were outside, inside. Around midnight, a worried Mayor Updike telegraphed Secretary of War Edwin Stanton down in Washington City. He urgently requested all New York regiments still in Pennsylvania be returned to New York City. With all the rain and humidity, it was a sticky night. The next morning, the sun rose, but for authorities, long before they were ready for it. It was Tuesday, July 14th, the same day Lee's Army of Northern Virginia, in retreat from defeat at Gettysburg, reached safely the south bank of the Potomac. Early that morning in Manhattan, the rioting began anew. One group, already up and at it, found an African-American by the name of William Jones. They strung him up. While a fire was built under him, he was pelted by clubs, stones, and sticks. Many involved were women. One block north, another African-American with the last name of Williams was lynched. By now, Updike's telegram had reached the capital. Incredibly, no one there had any clue of rioting in New York City as yet. But they needed to know, and they needed to react. For Tuesday morning's violence was as bad as the day before. One mob found the provost marshal's house on West 86th Street, ransacked it, then torched it. On East 86th, the 23rd Precinct Police Station was under attack. On West 32nd, James Costello, another African-American, was hanged from a lamppost. His house burned and his family chased into the next tenement. The mob evacuated all whites from that tenement house, then torched the building. A third crowd tried to storm Greeley's Tribune offices again, but a howitzer and armed employees drove them back. 
Another mass, greater than yesterday, stretching east to west along 2nd Avenue and from 22nd Street north to 32nd, moved on to the Union Steamworks. 200 policemen met them and drove them back. There, ragged shots of all calibers were fired, and joining them, missiles from street and roof. The mob countercharged, but the police held. As the mob lulled, some 150 militiamen raced down 35th Street. It was the 11th New York under Colonel H.J. O'Brien, and the mob, seeing men in uniform, swarmed toward them. As the two groups closed there on 35th, in downtown Manhattan, the 11th New York opened up with artillery fire. Two rounds, and when the crowd still came on, the 11th opened with canister from two six-pounders at point-blank range. In the face of all that shot and shell, the mob still surged forward. It took six rounds before they scattered. Meanwhile, the police thought the threat was over at the steamworks, but a new contingent broke into the building and stole hundreds of carbines, the building now their headquarters. While some 500 men hunkered down in the five-story steamworks building, others threw up barricades across 9th Avenue. Around noon, some 200 policemen, down to the last of their reserve, stormed the building held by the mob. Rather than use the steam building as a defensive bastion, the mob chose to attack the attackers. In desperate fighting, the police battled outside, and once some had gained inside, fought floor by floor. The two leaders that led the mob on the steamworks, a one-armed man and his young friend, were cut down. The one-armed warrior shot multiple times before he crumpled against an iron fence where a piling pierced his throat. There he bled to death. And into this mayhem on this Tuesday morning, New York Governor Seymour arrived. And from the front steps of City Hall, he began to speak. With police, militia, and mob all around, he spoke of reconciliation. And then grasping at straws, he virtually promised to end the draft. Mayor Updike echoed his sentiments. The two could have delivered their pleas in Cleveland for all the good they did. All through this second day of rioting, word of more lynching, murder, battle, fire, and plunder. About 1.30 p.m., an unruly crowd swept down 41st Street to the Weehawken Ferry Building. They burned a bar which belonged to a Republican, and its flames spread to the Ferry Building. About that time, the 11th New York's Colonel O'Brien, the same man who had earlier ordered artillery fire on the mob, returned to 2nd Avenue, the neighborhood where he lived. The mob saw him, and worse, recognized him. Remembering his orders earlier in the day, the cry went up, Cop lover! Murderer! Then insult morphed into violence. Dragged from his horse, Men and women beat and stoned him. His death did not soothe their anger, for they began to drag his lifeless body about. By now, the incentive for riot was changing. What was once a violent reaction to the draft and class now became little more than an excuse for bloodletting, plunder. To defend themselves, the mob erected a series of rough barricades from 37th Street to 45th. Poles, lampposts, overturned carts, telegraph wire were all used. Meanwhile, at about 6 p.m., combined police and militia moved to retake 9th Avenue. But the mob meant to stay. One line of authority laid down a covering fire, while another raced forward with axes to cut their way through obstacles. Then another wave would go up and over or around. Troopers followed with bayonets. It took over two hours, but each barricade was finally taken. A trend was now evident. Pitched battles were won by disciplined police and military. The mob got its licks in using guerrilla warfare. Far too many that day drank their courage. Incredibly, 
Of the 5,000 saloons in the besieged neighborhoods, none were closed that afternoon or night, and the strong drink fueled the mob to even greater atrocity. African Americans were set upon, and throughout Tuesday night there were incidents. Depending on the mob, the enemy's targets were either Protestant, Black, Republican, or the rich. On this night, there was no rain, none to douse flames or drive attackers inside, so the dark cloaked the plunder of private homes and stores. One such business was Brooks Brothers Clothing Store on Catherine Street. Fifty policemen answered this call, and floor by floor, aisle by aisle, they cleared the building. It was here where the first large-scale arrests were finally made. Around midnight, a telegram arrived from Washington City and from Secretary of War Stanton. It read, Five regiments are under orders to return to New York. It would take them some 24 hours to arrive. Coinciding with the hottest day of the year, the lawlessness lurched into Wednesday, July 15th. With the sun's rising, the violence began anew. Ann Derrickson, the wife of a black sailor, tried to keep one group from murdering her boy. Irish women had caught him as he played on 11th Street. When the mother intervened, the mob turned on her. They beat her so badly... She died several weeks later. At 300 Mulberry, the police was on its last legs. Militia and promised military would have to bear the brunt now. One militia force under Colonel Gershom Mott moved from 32nd Street to 8th Avenue, where three blacks dangled from lampposts above a sea of incited people. With one body of fire, women danced around all three. As those dancing moved and twirled, some knifed the bodies. Mott cut two of the bodies down, and then the mob went after him and his men with bricks, stones, and shots. The force was driven back onto 32nd Street and was pursued onto 7th Avenue. It was there, though, that the mob ran into more troops and two howitzers that opened with canister fire. Artillery was now used on 7th Avenue and 28th Street between 1st and 2nd Streets. Though this was the third day of rioting, the mob's anger had not subsided. Blacks and their housing still targeted. A force could scatter the crowds, but they always seemed to reassemble. And new targets were found. One mass was on the East River trying to destroy an iron ram under construction. In the midst of the madness, the press tried to explain. The world blamed Greeley's Tribune and the Times for creating the chaos. It also pleaded for gentleness in putting the rebellion down. The Daily News believed those in the mob were decent working people, their anger justified but their outrage far too zealous. And speaking of zealous, the New York Times' Henry J. Raymond commented on the use of artillery when he wrote, Give them grape and plenty of it. Finally, the graft-ridden New York Common Council met Wednesday afternoon and passed an ordinance empowering the city to borrow $2.5 million to set up a fund for any poor draftee who requested his substitute's fee be paid. Raymond's time called it nothing more than appeasement. The papers also noted that New York City was not the only city suffering. They noted draft riots in Boston. Troy, New York, and throughout little towns in Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio, acts largely unknown to those down in the Confederacy. In Washington City, the 16th president and his secretary of war preferred the crisis to be handled by state and local authorities, in part since Congress at that time was not in session. Some wondered if Confederate agents were behind all this. Someone did remember that 
One crowd at the corner of 33rd Street and 3rd Avenue did call for three cheers for Jefferson Davis. By the afternoon of the 15th, more militia had arrived. Hawkins Zouaves and Durier Zouaves advanced on one crowd that was as great as Monday's. Without any police help, they forced the mob back onto 1st Avenue, but again with the aid of artillery fire. However, this time, the mob seemed prepared for it. At the command of fire, they flattened and returned fire with carbines and rifles. Their targets? Militia officers. Around 6 p.m., the Zouaves were overwhelmed. Wounded soldiers left behind were clubbed to death. The two howitzers were captured without ammunition. They were of little use. More militia arrived, and by now, both sides were giving no quarter. As another day of bloodletting yielded to nightfall, from 10 p.m. to midnight, shock troops began to land. From Pennsylvania, the 74th New York arrived. Men who 13 days earlier took over 40% casualties stemming the attack of William Barksdale's Mississippians at Gettysburg were on the scene, and as they debarked from boats, they saw fires springing up across the river in Brooklyn. By 4 a.m. of Thursday, July 16th, the 7th New York came ashore at Canal Street. By 10 a.m., the 65th New York and an artillery battery from the 8th New York had arrived. Around 11 a.m., four detectives acting on a tip slipped into a resident building at number 10 11th Street. And on the second floor, they burst in and found John Andrews, the man who had called on the crowd to resist, to organize, in bed with a black mistress. He seemed to be about 35 years of age, blue-eyed, with brown hair, sandy beard, and he had a southern accent. He was sent in chains to a cell at Fort Lafayette in New York Harbor. On this day, the 16th, some order was finally being restored. Omnibuses and railway cars began to run again. Yet that night, there was one last spasm. It was at 2nd Avenue and 22nd Street. There, the militia took a beating, but fell back under the protection of artillery fire, which scattered the mob. Another supposed ringleader, Martin Moran, was captured. At 2 a.m. of the 17th, Police Commission President Thomas Acton tried to get some sleep. He had had none since 6 a.m. Monday. Friday the 17th brought a day of relative order. For all practical purposes, the rioters were spent. With some 20,000 troops now in Manhattan enforcing an uneasy calm, the New York City draft enrollment offices reopened August the 19th. When they did, a black-eyed city council appropriated enough funds to pay the commutation fees of drafted men, including, no doubt, some of the rioters. What? Of the 1863 draft across the North, only 13% of 292,441 failed to report. Of those who did, 65% received exemptions, nearly half on physical grounds. Of the 292,441 whose names were drawn, only 88,171 were held in service. And of that number, almost 60% paid a $300 commutation fee. Therefore, the 1863 draft netted just over 12% of the original 292,441 and all but 9,881 were substitutes, just over 3%. During the spring and fall of 1864, there were three more draft calls, and they were no more successful than the one in 1863. 
and one of the draft riots in smoldering New York City. On the 18th of July, 10 more Union regiments arrived. The, the rioting was done. The issues that caused it still remained. And so, hanging over and about the city, a simmering, sullen presence. After four days of rioting and violence in the nation's most populated city, we, though we'll never know the true number, believe some 119 were dead, 306 injured, and damages amounted to $1.5 million. Eventually, claims reaching $3 million were made against the city of New York. Stolen property was searched for. About $11,000 of the plunder, that taken from Brooks Brothers alone, was returned. We believe over 100 buildings had been burned, and the number of those arrested into the hundreds. The number that actually went to trial? Few. Only 19 were found guilty of a charge. And no one, I repeat, no one, was ever accused of murder. There was political fallout. New York City Mayor George Updike never ran for another office. Governor Horatio Seymour ran for president in 1868. But there are those who believe his lack of leadership in the New York City crises contributed to his defeat. The draft riots had played themselves out, but few learned from it. At neither the local, state, or federal level was there any investigation of the riot or its causes. States, counties, and communities did offer an alternative to the draft. Bounties, cash payments were offered to entice young men to volunteer. Again, it is interesting to note the draft for all of its intent and controversy, accounted for only about 6% of those who served in the Union war effort. The significance of those bloody, riotous days, still the largest civil and most racially charged urban disturbance in American history, those riots were the violent manifestation of those who felt powerless to control their destinies. Civil war, Emancipation and a compulsory draft were the struck matches, but decades of frustration and anger over class and race were the incendiary stuff that turned a fire into an explosion. Indeed, some of the very same issues that rocked this nation in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And so... Here we are in the 21st century, over a century and a half after the conflict, and though the draft is gone, our nation continues to be the stage for great unrest, agitation, and violent reaction, largely spawned by two issues in particular that, as human nature goes, have been with us for centuries were with those in New York City in July of 1863 that dogged those living in the late 60s and scowls at us even today. Class division, race. We can learn from the July riots of 1863, but only if we let it. We may not like some of our history, and true, there are many events for which we should be embarrassed. But we should, we need, indeed we must study our past and hopefully learn from it. For until we do, we'll stumble and we'll struggle time and time again. Next time we gather, we head west of the Mississippi again to the border state of Missouri, which tried to maintain a most precarious balance, a slave-holding state still within the fold of the Union. It was a balance too often disrupted. 
creating a most lethal kind of conflict. Civil war within a civil war. In our next episode, unholy and uncivil war in the 24th state. I hope you'll be with us. This is Fred Kiger. Be safe, responsible, and thank you for listening.